open your Bible to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 is where we'll be at today. Romans 12, 3 specifically. The church began through the movements and empowerments of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The mission of this church was to make disciples of all nations to the glory of God. We who are part of this church live as disciples as well. The message of the church is the gospel of Jesus Christ died, resurrected for our sin. The front door of this church is baptism, believer's baptism that is, leading to born again church membership. The continual meal once you've entered through that front door is that symbolic meal known as the Lord's Supper. The keys of the church, what are those? Those keys that we looked at last week is what we call church discipline. It is for the sake of restoration for the individual and purity and unity for the body of Christ. I want to say thank you. To those of you who were here last week for surviving what may have been a shock to your system as we broached that topic of church discipline. And today we're going to do something that is far less controversial. Uh, we're going to look at spiritual gifts. And so I'm going to go right to God's word, his unerring, authoritative, inspired word. And let's listen to what the apostle Paul says to the church in Rome about spiritual gifts. He says this in verse 3. He says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ. Verse 5 should be familiar to us. And individually, we are members of one, one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Oh, how we need to know that we have a gracious God who in his sovereignty has gifted us with spiritual gifts. He has not left us alone to figure it out in the dark and cobble together this community of believers on mission together and to do it alone. He has given you and I his spirit and then he went a step further. He equipped us with the tools needed so we can fulfill that work of making deep disciples to the glory of God. Let me pray for us, and we're just going to go right into it. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would give us clarity now as we dive into your word. Your word is your power. It never returns void. We acknowledge that the gospel always accomplishes what you mean for it to accomplish. And so, Lord, let it soften us this morning. Let it speak to us, Lord, in all walks of life who are here this morning. Let us hear what Romans has to say to us about our part that we play in your church. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Uh, Romans is one of the most glorious, if not the most glorious book in the Bible. And if you uh, know where you're at here in Romans 12, Paul has finished 11 incredible lofty chapters talking about justification and sovereign election and he caps that off at the end of chapter 11 and he says who has known the mind of the lord who has been his counselor or who has given him a gift by which he must be repaid and so paul ends with praising the lord and he switches in chapter 12 chapter 12 is like a hinge chapter for the rest of the book that is all about application. So the first part is telling you this high doctrine. This is kind of Paul's method in several of his letters. If you look for it, you can, can pay attention. He gives you doctrine and then he gives you application. He starts here in chapter 12 and he says, therefore, 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, this is what we quoted a moment ago, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be trans- conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is a good and acceptable and perfect. And so he takes this command here and he says, based on everything I just told you, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let your life be one, an act of worship. And so it's no surprise then he says, well, let me show you how that's supposed to work in the context of the church. And then he proceeds and he says, let me show you the kind of mindset you should have as you exercise spiritual gifts. He calls us to get the right perspective about ourselves. To not think more highly or, or lower, but rightly about ourselves as we practice these gifts. Okay, so there are five lists. If, you're, if you go through your New Testament, you're going to see that there's five lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. You have two in 1 Corinthians 12. You have another one in Ephesians 4. You have one in 1 Peter 2. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, and then we have this one in front of us. Um, I thought it would be wise for us to look at the one here in Romans 12. Someone might say, why aren't we doing the one in 1 Corinthians 12? That's the, that's the longer in-depth one, and the short answer is, we're going to go through the whole book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians at some point in the future. We're going to save that for that time, but we'll reference back to 1 Corinthians 12. So if you know that passage, you're going to see it come up in what we're going to do right now. I've been on a long journey personally, if you know my story, when it comes to spiritual gifts and the work of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I know. There is a lot of confusion in evangelical circles about spiritual gifts. And so the goal of what I want to do right now is that we would do some clearing away of confusion. We would bring clarity that we would know the individual role that you and I play in how we make up this one body. And then lastly that we have the right perspective that verse 3 talks about, the right attitude as we approach these. Paul begins by saying, by the grace given to me. And that is a tip of the hat to his apostolic authority. And this is probably as good of a place as any for us to just come right out with it and just get to work immediately and say, this gift, this office of apostle that Paul refers to here, you see it more clearly in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the first verse, that he says he is an apostle called by God to preach the gospel. Let me ask you this question. Paul's authority as an apostle that he has, does that exist today? That's kind of a trick question in a way. We would say, yes, we have God's written word. But the real question behind that is the idea of New Test- Testament office or spiritual gift of apostleship, does that exist today? Have you ever met someone who you approached or approached you and said, hi, my name is John or Susie, and I am an apostle? What would you say to that person? Do apostles like Paul exist today? I think to answer that question, you have to look at what the New Testament says about apostles and the requirements or the qualifications it takes to be an apostle. Uh, There's several who are called apostle in scripture. You have the 12 Disciples, also called apostles, minus Judas, um, who is replaced by Matthias. You can look at in, in the, the passage in Acts right before Pentecost that talks about this. You have Paul, Barnabas, James are some, possibly a few others, Silas, Timothy, Epaphroditus. Some have seen Andronicus and Junia in the end of Romans 16. I'm not so convinced by that, but some have asked that question, are they apostles? But it seems like there's a unique group that exists in the New Testament who have this this heading over their head called apostle. What are their qualifications? Well, Peter makes it very clear. If you were to read the first chapter of the book of Acts, after Judas needs to be replaced, Peter says these words. He said, so one of the men who have accompanied, accompanied us during a time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, Beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he has, was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And so the requirement for replacing Judas 
To be an apostle in the early part of the church is that you had to be an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. Maybe, maybe immediately as I say that, you go, well, what about Paul? Paul wasn't there. At least we don't get anything in the end of the Gospels that talk about how he was present after Jesus rose from the dead. But Paul in Acts 9 has a unique encounter. What is that encounter? It's the, the road to Damascus experience. Uh, Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 9, 1, defending his apostleship, he'll say, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the risen Lord? Paul understands that he has, in fact, seen the risen Lord, and he saw him on the road to Damascus where he was blinded by the light of Christ who said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so Paul will say in Acts 26, recounting this experience, he will say that, he will say that Jesus said to him, rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to, pen, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So that tells us the second qualification. So hear me on this. First calling, first requirement of an apostle is that he has seen the resurrected Jesus. The second one is that Jesus himself has commissioned the apostle. He did that with Paul. He does that in Matthew 10 with the other 12. He does that in, again in a renewed sense in the beginning of Acts 1, 2, verse 8. He commissioned them to be his witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so Paul, by no coincidence, will call himself a servant of Christ Jesus call to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So you must be an eyewitness to Jesus, and you must have been, you must have been commissioned by the resurrected Christ. That's a high bar, okay? And so what was the unique ministry of these people? The unique ministry of the apostles was that they were in the initial leaders who presented the gospel that established the church. Uh, their ministry was also accompanied by Signs and wonders. Second Corinthians talks about how the mark of a true apostle is that he performs these miracles. So when you read Acts, you're going to see how uh, they're performing healings. For example, uh, they were praying and laying hands on the sick, the lame, the paralyzed, and they were healed. Even those who, there were even accounts of those who were resurrected from the dead. And so in this unique ministry, they had a unique authority as well. Paul could look at someone and say, as in all of the churches, I call, I call you to do this. Does anybody you know today have that right to be able to do what Paul's doing? That's what Paul does. And with that unique authority comes with some of the apostles, the ability that when they are writing scripture, we have an apostolic word. So when you look at your New Testament, okay, so let's do this. When you look at your New Testament, why do we have the 27 books of the, of the New Testament that we have? Well, 22 of them come from apostles themselves. You have John, you have Matthew, Paul, James, and Peter wrote 22 of our 27 books. Several others, including Mark and, and Luke's gospel, as well as the book of Acts, those, though those people aren't apostles themselves, by their deep and close association with the apostles, their words are also considered apostolic as well. And so when you ask the question, how do we get our New Testament? It was the early church that was saying, is it apostolic? And so that's why you get some non-canonical, non-New Testament texts that exist in those first few centuries and the reason they don't qualify is because they're not apostolic, having been directly commissioned by the Lord Jesus himself to give us the inspired word that we have in front of us. What does that mean then? What does it mean about this precious word that you and I have? It means that this is the apostolic word for us today. And so this is the apostolic word inscripturated for us and so therefore, I would argue that we don't need apostles today because we have the words of the apostles right here in front of us, inspired by God. Ephesians 2.20 also says 
that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And so that initial foundational church building work in the first century that was accomplished through the apostles has been completed. And so today, you and I listen to apostolic words, but it comes from this book right in front of us. And so, uh, to use a technical term here, I am what you would call a cessationist. You hear it in the word there, cease. A cessationist when it comes to the office or the gift of the apostle. I would be what you would call a continuationist. That's the other term, cessationist. Continuationist when it comes to many of the other spiritual gifts, including uh, gifts like healings and others. And so, um, I'm not a cessationist on all gifts but at least on this one. And so consider what this would mean. That means that for the church today, how many offices, so we've been doing a series on the church, how many offices exist in the church that Bethesda should have? How many? Two, good. And and what are they? That of the pastor or elder, your elders are your pastor, okay? And the second one would be deacons. Uh, by the way, we'll, we'll get to this in the coming weeks. If you walk up to one of our elders and say, hey, pastor, how are you? Watch their eyes get big. That, that would be very good for them to receive that and hear that. Apostles, pardon me, elders are pastors. Pastors are elders. And then we also have deacons, okay? We'll look at that in the coming weeks. Reason I take time to bring this up is because there's a teaching that exists out there that says, while there are big letter A, apostles that exist in the New Testament. There's little A, apostles that exist today. And so you, maybe you've come across someone who's very charismatic, uh, is kind of like a global church planner, uh, leads movements, and maybe people refer to them as being like a little A, not on the level of Paul, but a little A apostle. You ever come across people like that? I, I most certainly have. What do we do with that kind of mindset of people who say that there are little A apostles today? I would say the scripture makes no such distinction. You just, I just went through some of the text with you. You are not going to see that distinction in scripture. And so I would encourage us, don't place categories on scripture that scripture doesn't give us ourselves. Instead, don't add to scripture. I was in a, I was at a, not the conference I was just at, but I was at a, another conference a few years back and one of the main speakers talked about how he was an apostle and would speak to us about how he would give us permission to act out on certain things and, and, to, and to act in certain ways. And I remember sitting there going, brother, I don't need your permission to do anything. My permission comes from what this book has to say. This is where our authority lies. We stand upon God's word alone. That's the main point. And so Paul, an apostle, going back to those words, by the grace given to him, He speaks authoritatively to you and I this morning, and he says these profound words. Don't think too highly of yourself. That's what he says. Be sober-minded in how you think of yourself. Be humble. Don't let yourself well up with pride. Are you the kind of person that when you walk into a room, do you have certain expectations that people will acknowledge you or cater to you in a certain way? Is your reputation, self-built reputation, the essence of your identity? Man, throw reputation out. Do you think that your giftings is what makes you who you are? Remember, friend, they are gifts. You did not earn them. They were given to you. And so see yourself, not how, not how you, it's not about how you see yourself or how others see yourself, see you. It is about how God sees you. Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 4, one of my favorite passages, he'll say this, I'm not really worried about how you judge me. In fact, I don't even judge myself. It is the Lord who judges me. And the Lord has looked at every single one of us and has declared us justified. We were sinners, but now we are righteous because of the blood of Christ that has been shed for us. And so here's really good news. You don't have to view yourself according to the world's standard. And you don't have to view it according to your standard either. You view it according to how Jesus sees you. And he covers you with his righteousness. So let that be enough. So with that humble, God-given perspective, Paul then says, let me tell you how spiritual gifts work. 
He says in verse 4 something familiar to us. For as in one body we are many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And so you are one of several members that make up the one whole body of Christ. This, we, we, have, we have covered this over the last few weeks. The, the Bible gives you and I several pictures of what the church is about. Think about this when you hear people talking about the church. You'll hear me. I will use the word body of Christ. Family would be another word that, that we use. Scripture gives many. And it's a wonderful, wonderful display of the imagery of what the church is supposed to be about. A temple, a holy nation, vines on a branch, salt of the earth, the Israel of God, a royal priesthood, a temple, a people, the elect lady. You'll see that in, in John's, one of John's epistles. And then we have the one here that the church is supposed to be like a body. And you need every single one of these image, uh, images, which are a shadow that points to the more true reality of what this is right now, the assembly, the gathered church. For example, here's an image that you need. I ask you to hear me on this. You need to understand that the church is like a bride to Christ. Ephesians 5 talks about this. It talks about how makes a comparison and says the husband plays a role and the wife plays a role. The wife is called to graciously submit and follow, something that is very countercultural in our current moment today. But submit and follow her husband graciously. In the same way, the husband is called to sacrificially lead and to love his wife in a way that's willing to even lay down his own life for his, his bride. And so the comparison is made between the wife and the husband to the more true reality, which is that of the church and Christ. As the wife submits to her husband, the church submits to Christ. And Christ, as the, as the husband, leads graciously and lovingly and sacrificially his wife. So Christ did the same thing for the church as he laid down his life for her. Marriage is a mystery my wife is still mysterious to me in certain ways after nine years. But more truly, as I learn the joy of marriage that God has given me, it is a mystery in this way that it points to the love relationship between Christ and the church. Marriage is a, is a mirror that points beyond itself. This is one of the reasons why distortions of marriage in our modern culture between one man and one woman for life are so disastrous. So you think about this. If you mess with the roles, the role that the husband's supposed to play in comparison to the role that the wife is supposed to play, you bring damage upon the more true reality of the role that Christ plays versus what the church plays. If you don't have one man and one woman, who plays which role? It becomes confusing. You distort the imagery. If you mess with the roles, the husband who's supposed to reflect Christ and the wife who is supposed to reflect the church, you distort the more true reality of what is meant to be displayed. And I just want to say, I find this to be, what I find to be so surprising in evangelical circles is I don't hear this argument being used more often when it comes to dealing with so-called same-sex marriage. If we had more of a concern about the church and the value that Jesus has for the bride which he died for, Maybe the reason why we would be against any distortion of marriage is because it's distorting Christ's relationship with the church. Perhaps if a greater priority was placed on God's word, what it says about the church and her value, in comparison to a misplaced notion, the secular understanding of inclusion, God's church, whom Jesus died for, would burn more brightly than it does in American culture. If you need any evidence for the dimming of this light, there are several denominations whose light is rapidly going out that you can see even in our own town. Church, we need every single picture that scripture gives us of the church to understand it properly. And we celebrate those pictures as faithful servants. 
So we have the bride, that's one example, but the one that's before us is that of the body. And so let's now look at verses 6 through 8. Every single one of us has what is called a charismata. You can hear, hear right there in that word, charismata. That's the word that stands behind gift in your Bible right there in verse 6. Every single Christian has one, a charismata. The, the, if you ever meet someone who is called charis, that's just the word behind that is, is grace. And that's what that, that Greek word means. So every single one of us has a grace gift. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 speaks about how the Spirit apportions as He wills each gift that we have. And so what, what a great indicator of the gospel right here. That though you and I were once sinners, it's like the king has brought, brought in unworthy peasants into his land. And then he has elevated them, has put a robe around them, given them a scepter that they don't deserve. Has equipped them in ways that are far too lavish. God has given you and I his spirit and his giftings from himself. Consider the source so that we would be able to serve in his kingdom. I think this is the right moment to bring up what some view as certain gifts that are required for the believer. There are some in Pentecostal circles, and maybe you've come across this, that have said that, for example, tongue speaking is a required demonstration of the Christian life. And yet you read right here in this text, it is a grace, each gift that we have. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 is clear. The Spirit decides which gift we have. And so not every single one of us all have the same giftings. We are given unique giftings according to who we are. God created you and me with different ones. If we all had the same gift, well, that would be very unproductive. I've come across some people who say, well, the reason you don't have that gift is because you haven't asked for it. If you would only ask for the gift, then you would have it. And I just want to say, the testimony of many of our lives demonstrates that that's not true. Not everybody has the gift of teaching. Not everybody has other gifts that Scripture speaks of. But God knows what he was doing when he gave you the gift he gave you. And so each person has at least one for this reason. The common good. And we're right back at the Great Commission. To make disciples. You've been given the gift so that you would be able to make deeper disciples to God's glory. Maybe you ask the question, okay, what's the difference between a spiritual gift and just a skill, Aaron? Aren't you just slapping on a really mystical word onto what is just a natural ability that many of us have? What's the difference, for example, like the gift of teaching versus what an educator does in teaching science in the classroom? What's the difference between the two? John Stott, in his book, Baptism and Fullness, which helped dig me out of some of the incorrect teaching that I once had on the Spirit. Baptism fullness. John Stott says this. What is new, what turns a natural endowment into a spiritual gift, must lie in the reality of their objective. The causes which they serve and which they give, so objective, and their motive, the incentives that guide them. We must look for the peculiarities of the spiritual gifts, for example, teaching and encouragement, and the heightening of their intensification, the Christianizing of a natural endowment. That's the key. The Christianizing of a natural endowment already present or at least latent. Thus, a man can be a gifted teacher before his conversion and may after it be given the charisma of teaching to enable him to expound with insight, clarity, and relevance. Do you get what he's saying? He is saying the difference is the purpose in which you use that ability and the intention in which you use that ability that God has given you. Either way you cut it, God is your creator. He has made you. And so regardless of what point you want to say when you got that gift, he is your maker, so he gave it to you to begin with. And the difference between the unbeliever and the believer in that ability is that as an unbeliever, it was impossible for you to glorify God and now with the Spirit, you have been equipped to do so with that ability that he's given you. And so now we come to the list of seven. The first one, oh boy, prophecy. Let's go. 
prophecy. I've seen four different definitions on this. I've seen prophecy as being merely an equal sign to teaching or preaching, what I'm doing right now. I've seen prophecy um, in more black church contexts as being speaking truth to power. I've seen that example there. Um, Maybe when you think of prophecy, you naturally think of telling the future. That's probably the most common one people think of. Let me give you a definition that I think is the right understanding of this word prophecy. It is a spontaneous revelation for a concrete application. A spontaneous revelation for a concrete application. For example, Agabus in the book of Acts, uh, he is a prophet and he prophesies about how there is a famine that is coming underneath Claudius' rule. Or in chapter, uh, further on in the chapter that speaks about Paul going down to Jerusalem, Agabus comes to him again, takes his belt, ties Paul's belt around himself, and says, this is what is going to happen to the person who goes down to Jerusalem. He will be taken captive by the Jews. And so while we don't have the time to go into great detail on this gift this morning, I just want to say to you a few words about how this spontaneous revelation works and whether it works today. I used to hold to a view of prophecy um, that that would, had the potential to be errant. New Testament prophecy that had the potential to be errant. Um, you can get it right sometimes. Sometimes you can get it wrong. The revelation's always right. But sometimes the vehicle, the person, gets the interpretation of that pure revelation wrong. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, you got to practice it. That's how I understood this for years. But three things convinced me that this view was wrong. The first one was this. I came to see that I needed to keep a connection between New Testament prophecy mentioned here and Old Testament prophecy that is talked about For example, in Deuteronomy and other places in your Old Testament. Just think about it. Does Paul's view of prophecy just pop out of the sky? No, he's a good Jew who's reading his Torah. And that category of prophecy comes from his Old Testament. And so you should read the Old Testament for how prophecy is described. And so the second thing is when you read the Old Testament, it says the way you can tell whether a prophet is the real deal or not is whether what he says comes to pass. So the question I would have for you is this. If you believe that prophecy exists today and it can err, how can you possibly discern a true prophet from a false prophet? You have no bar to test if error is allowed. If the bar, is, if the, if the bar according to the Old Testament is that if he errs, that's how you know he's not one, and you throw that out, you have no way to discern a true prophet from a false one. Thirdly, I found myself being very inconsistent I quoted to you Ephesians 2.20 that says, the foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets. And I was willing to say, as I said a moment ago, that apostles don't exist today, but we have the word, the foundational word for us. I was willing to say that about apostles, but not about prophets as well. Apostles as well as prophets function in that foundational unique role. And so New Testament prophets, if I could sum up this for us, is this are on par with Old Testament prophets. And they played a foundational role in the early church in the first century, and they are no longer in function today. Most of what I have witnessed, of what I, uh, what I have seen called prophecy, I would use another word for it. I would say it, it would be more akin to something like impressions. Maybe someone would say, Aaron, or, or, or maybe I could put it this way. Someone uh, might say to me, Aaron, I feel a sense that God is calling me to sit, say this and speak this X, Y, Z thing into your life. For me, I don't dismiss that. I take it under consideration. But you test every word spoken through what this word has to say. This, this is the filter, friends. We should listen to the words of those who, who are spirit-filled, prayed up, brothers and sisters, who might speak a timely word into our life. Maybe you might say, well, that's just semantics. Aaron, you're trading the word prophecy for impressions. And I would argue, no. I would say that by holding to this understanding, we are keeping ourselves from the danger of false prophets, just the way we would do of of false apostles who like to put big words, titles over their head so that they would have a higher authority 
than that that exists in the church today. I think when you categorize rightly that these are impressions, that they can be wrong, is that you place them properly in their place underneath the Scripture. And so we get that spirit-filled, prayer-filled word on a lower level than inspired Scripture. That's where I'm at. I've been on a journey with this, and I want to acknowledge some Christians see this differently. If that is you, I want you to know that Bethesda is a big enough tent for both you and I to be here, and that we can charitably disagree over not even secondary matters, but tertiary, further down matters. But my main ask for all of us is that we would let this word be supreme. Okay, that's a lot on prophecy. We'll go quickly through the next several here. Service. Thank God this one is easier to describe. Service. Uh, Standing behind this is the word diakonon, deacon, table waiter that you see here. If you aren't sure what a servant-hearted person looks like at Bethesda, you should be able to look no further than our deacons who serve in selfless ways that, that you don't even know but edify you week after week. When I think of those who have demonstrated this gift in exemplary ways, I think of our chairman who is stepping down at the end of his term here. Actually, within the next, actually today is October 1st. Today would be the last day. And so I think of of people like John A. Hart, who has served tirelessly for many years. And so uh, to Joy, thank you for letting us have your husband all those late nights. Bethesda is better for it. And so that is service. Teaching. D.A. Carson says that there's three stages to the gospel. Discovery. Sustaining the gospel, discovery of the gospel, sustaining the gospel, and losing the gospel. If you don't hold on to the teachings of the church's tradition from one generation to the next, you will lose it. Many of us today have a mindset that we need to get people back into church. Friend, I want you to know that in many parts of our country, as well as in Huron, it's not that we need to get people back into church you already have kids whose parents stopped going to church. So you're already another generation removed. You don't need to get people back into church. They have no Christian categories to begin with. When the gospel is lost, it is, has incredible consequences. And so for you and I, I have this gift of teaching, but it's not just me. This exists from, from the nursery and cubbies all the way up to Sam's. That we teach the tradition of the gospel. What's the difference between... Teaching and prophecy. Prophecy is spontaneous. Teaching requires study to understand what God's word says and to teach it accurately. The third one here is exhortation. Exhortation is is a more clear call to stir up those who may be apathetic. To get people up from their lethargy. Wake up. Stand up. Get working. Get moving. Encourage. Let's go. Let's do this together. That's exhortation. Perhaps you have that gift. Next one here is generosity, and I should say this, having the gift of generosity is not an excuse for church members to say, well, I don't have that gift, and so I don't need to give generously out of what God has given me. God calls us to be cheerful givers in his church, and I believe this verse in view that describes generosity refers to those who have the gift of gift-giving. And particularly those who out of the abundance of what God has given them can leverage for the sake of the kingdom more in ways that others can't. I think you see generosity a few verses down if you were to keep reading reading in hospitality, for example. Opening up your home. There's many ways to do this. Next one is leadership. This would be our ministry coordinators, our elders. Those of us who are called to stand up and say to others, follow me as I follow Christ. Acts of mercy. Acts of mercy is a deep care for others who are in need. A stereotype that I grew up with was prophets are the ones who really bring down the hammer and the mercy people are the criers in the church. Those are the ones who are weeping over everything. Um, uh, They sense the burdens of others more acutely. And I would say this is, that actually is probably more in the realm of the gift of discernment 
the spiritual gift of acts of mercy is more like those who participate in mercy ministries, who, who see practical needs and assist those who are in need. And so these are seven of the gifts. These are, this is not all of the gifts that exist in Scripture. In fact, I don't think Scripture mentions all of the gifts that even do exist. Paul is being occasional here. So you can think of many. These are just a few. With our time that remains, I want us to think of four things and then we'll be done. First consideration is this. Okay, Aaron, how do I know what my spiritual gift is? Maybe the first response some think of is, well, take a spiritual gift survey. Take a spiritual gift survey and then you can know. And I would say, I think you'd be better off if you had your wife or your husband take the spiritual gift survey for you, I have that horrible tendency of when I take some sort of personality test or a spiritual gift survey, I like to play the game and go, oh yeah, that one's me, that one's me. And, and, I, and I try to rig the game along the way. I can't be honest with it. And so I would caution us in this way. Don't think about spiritual gifts the way you think of, for example, the Enneagram um, and personality tests. We still do that, the Enneagram. I had some friends who were so into that a few years ago. I'm a six, I'm a seven, I'm a four. I don't care. You know, that just, it was just ridiculous. And ironically, you can be so, so, so inward focused about how you're described. And ironically, you're missing about how the spiritual gift is supposed to be a blessing to others. And so I think a better way is the simple way. If you want to know what your spiritual gift is, friend, is to look for the needs of the church see the gaps and fill them. Say, here am I, Lord, send me. We are so, we think we are courageous to say it with Esther, who said, I will go into the king and if I perish, I perish. If you, if you are willing to say that, I want to ask, are, are you willing to hold a toddler on a Sunday morning? If you're courageous to stand up for your faith, will you say, here am I, Lord, send me and take care of a toddler in the nursery? I think that'll show how courageous you really are. You might find, though, that by saying yes, the Lord will do an incredible work through you. It'll bring joy to you, honestly. Stott, again, John Stott says, that unfortunately the traditional image of the local church is that of an overworked pastor, assisted perhaps by a small nucleus of dedicated workers, while the majority of members make little or no contribution to the church's life and work. It conjures up the picture, rather, of a bus, one driver with many drowsy passengers, then of a body, all members active, each contributing a particular activity to the health and effectiveness of the whole. Oh, that Bethesda would not be like a bus with a whole bunch of drowsy passengers, but we would be a body that operates on all cylinders. Can you imagine what that would look like if we actually were that way? I can. A church with deep doctrine, but also with deep disciples who humbly serve together with the gifts of the Spirit and as they do so with the fruit of the Spirit and a deep joy so that when unbelievers see you and I, they go, how do they have so much joy in their serving selflessly others that I don't have myself? I want that for myself. And so friend, I would say, Find your gift by simply seeing the need in the church and filling it. God will show you quickly, I'm sure of it, whether that gift is for you. And the church will be blessed as a result. Second, pursue your ministry according to your giftings, not somebody else's. Paul says to Timothy in his last letter, he says, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. God knew what he was doing when he gave you the gift he gave you, and he doesn't make mistakes. Do you struggle with jealousy towards another who has perhaps what you want? That person did not make that gift up, God gave it to him, and God knew what he was doing by giving you something different. Trust the Lord in what he is doing. I would also say that this is a good place for our elders and ministry leaders to be reminded of this. The pathway to burnout in volunteer and in church service is to put someone in a certain area of service 
for an extended period of time that is outside of their giftings. Anyone can serve for a short period of time and take a bullet and be able to serve in, in a way that may be outside of their gifting for a short period of time, but you do it for a long period of time, that can be soul crushing. Let us be wise that we put the right people in the right place where they should serve. Third, this is the one that's probably most dear to me, is that we would call out the called at Bethesda. I told you about how when I was 16 years old, had been a Christian for about 10 minutes, it seemed. Christy Steuben came to me, and she said, I want you to give your testimony in chapel. And I gave a five-minute testimony. I still have the original notes from when I gave that first little message that was probably awful. But I remember it was my teachers afterwards who came up to me and said, yo, man, don't stop doing that. You got something there. Hold on to it. I want to ask you and I, do we do that for young people at Bethesda? Do we call out the call? Do we call out the call? I will say, just by saying yes to God's call on my life has led me in ways I would have never imagined. This is why we do internships. This is why we had an intern this summer, so that we would train up the next generation. I need you to know this. There's a crisis amongst Mennonite brethren today, our denomination. There are conversations that are going on right now realizing there are not young people to replace pastors or church leaders. I've been asked to go to a summit here in January to figure out how we can come up with a better system. And I just want to say the solution is not from top down, coming up with a, another structure, another initiative, another task force or whatever. But the right approach is from the ground up. What is happening in our local church that you and I are looking at younger people and saying, you've got something, friend. Don't stop. Keep going. Keep going. There may be those of us who are in our midst today that God has called to ministry who need to say a gospel goodbye to us and go where God has called them. Let's tap them on the shoulders. And then the last one here. Consider the manner in which we use these gifts. Do you notice that in the list of seven? It not only listed seven, but it talked about how these gifts should operate. The one who exhorts in his exhortation, contributes in his generosity, who leads with zeal, mercy, done with cheerfulness. My prayer for us is that we would not use the gifts of the Spirit separated from the fruit of the Spirit. There's a reason Paul sandwiches between 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 on spiritual gifts, the love chapter in chapter 13. If I have all of the gifts, but I don't have love, I am nothing. My prayer for us is that we would not only be characterized by these great gifts, but we would be more importantly characterized by love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, gentleness, self-control, that we would not just act and do the work of the church, but we would look like Christ as we do, serve with the right heart. Church family, bride of Christ, body of Christ, our identity is not in these grace gifts, but it is in the giver of grace. And that will help us to keep the right perspective as we go forward. Verse 5 speaks about how we are that one body who is in Christ. And so let our identity and how we serve as we go forward in the coming weeks, coming days, and coming months be identified by who we are in Christ, who has empowered us to live and to act, to glorify his name and to bless one another. Let me pray.